All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Lane Timms, and uh, as he said, I'm going to be talking about uh, honeypots, um, a new twist on defending enterprise networks with dynamic deception at scale. So a few pieces of information to keep in mind here as I go through is a few key words. Uh, honeypots, a twist, because we're going to be talking about Twisted, uh, which is a Python-based networking framework. Um, dynamic deception and scale. So before I get started, just a little bit about me. I actually don't work with honeypots on a day-to-day -day basis. This was just a little bitty tinker project that I started working on. And, uh, but anyway, on my day-to-day -day, uh, activities, I work in vulnerability management on the vulnerability and exposure research team for Tripwire. Uh, I have a PhD from Georgia Tech and 15 years experience across IT, software, engineering, and cybersecurity. So, as I said, I'm talking about enterprise scale systems. And uh, in my previous, um, some previous work I've done, I've worked with some advanced manufacturing uh, projects. And um, I've become a little bit focused on um, new, uh, new types of uh, technology called like industrial internet or industrial internet of things. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a good way to start motivating the subject is, you know, our enterprise networks of today uh, aren't like they were 10 years ago, obviously. Um, but more and more nowadays because of advancing technologies, many of our enterprise networks, especially within certain sectors like critical infrastructure and uh, advanced manufacturing, those networks are becoming much more complex and very interesting. And as an engineer, uh, it's really a cool time to be an engineer. For example, I don't know if you've ever heard of a digital twin, but a digital twin refers to a digital replica of a physical asset. Um, it's essentially how we are now able to interface physical systems with computing and communication uh, devices. And to do such a thing as this thing like a digital twin, it requires a very sophisticated computing and communication infrastructure. But as you know, one of the reasons we're all here is that to, to really gain the, few, the, the, the true potential of where we're going with technology nowadays, um, cybersecurity is actually a limiting factor. We can't really do what we could do um, in terms of technology and technology development because of security. And unfortunately, in security, time is always against us. So one of the things that I'm talking about here today in terms of dynamic deception and, and using honeypots in kind of a new way, um, what we want to do is we want to decrease the amount of time it takes us you know, on the good side to detect attacks and then respond to those attacks. But at the same time, we'd like to be able to increase the amount of time as well as the amount of the cost for cyber attackers. So that's one of the goals of this project that I had. So let's talk about deception. Um, by definition, it's, the, it's to cause someone, or in our case, we, we're dealing with technology and computing, it could be something like automated software, um, but we want to deceive it. We want it to believe something that's, that's not true so that we can actually get something, that we can gain something out of it. So that's why we use deception when we talk about uh, certain types of technologies like honeypots. But before we get into uh, cyber defense, um, everybody, you know, in terms of using the word deception, uh, some of the words that we hear on a day-to-day -day basis that we're all are familiar with, social engineering, phishing, spam, these are all types of deception uh, attacks. When we get into some of these industrial internet environments that I was mentioning earlier, um, there's other types of uh, deception-based attacks. Uh, and this is done via what we call signal injection. So attackers, when they gain a foothold inside of a, a large industrial internet type of network, they can spoof sensor measurements, control inputs, timestamps, identity information, and such. So these are the types of deception-based cyber attacks. Um, but when we talk about deception-based cybersecurity, the traditional technology has been a honeypot. And a honeypot is basically a computing asset used for detecting, deflecting, or counteracting unauthorized use of information. 
they've traditionally been used as a mechanism to detect something that's going on within a network uh, to fool the attacker. But once once that uh, honeypot is accessed, you you know the IT department or the security department knows, hey, something's going wrong because that system shouldn't be accessed right now. But nowadays, we have technology on our side that lets us um, take it to a new level, where now not only can we use it for detection, but we can also, also use it to create massive amounts of confusion. And if we can do this correctly, uh, we can actually induce a time um, delay on the attack sources, but that also gives us more time to counteract appropriately. We can use this to increase the cost of attack and thereby, in certain cases, reduce attack motivation. So I kind of say that honeypots were a little bit ahead of their time. Ten years ago, I never would have thought I'd be given a presentation on honeypots. But now, scale is no longer an issue. And to, let me clarify that a little bit. In the early days of honeypots, you'd have to go buy a, a single device to deploy a single honeypot. So if you had a network of, say, hundreds or thousands of nodes, and you had one or two or three honeypots, they were kind of statistically insignificant. You might get a little bit of, out of them from detection, but statistically they were insignificant, especially in, in the form of confusion. So one of the goals of this work, or the goals of this work, are to use honeypots at scale, um, to do the traditional mechanism of detecting real-time attacks, but also to create lots of confusion. And nowadays, because of all of the threat intelligence technology we have, we can actually uh, take the detection part of honeypots to a new level, to where we can actually spread this information to our partners using threat intelligence feeds and such. And lastly, we want to be able to implement real-time controls when we detect using the traps of a honeypot to stop attackers inside. Now just to go back to this original image I had here, one of the things, a few things I wanted to point out. Uh, one is insider threat. When we talk about honeypots, unless you're just doing some particular type of research, you don't really care about putting a honeypot on internet facing networks or directly connected to the internet. You're not gonna gain a lot of information other than observing how a particular attacker might interact with a given honeypot. What we're interested in is when the inevitable happens and an attacker gets, uh, gains a foothold on the inside of your network, what we would call an insider threat. That's where these devices can really, or this, this technology could really um, make a big difference. Uh, and the second point I want to make is going back to the diagram, and this is one example of many types of examples I could come up with, but this, is, this image uh, illustrates a modern enterprise network that has been integrated with their industrial system. In this case, it's a, it's a, it's a water utility facility, but it could be any type of other, um, once, once again, critical infrastructure, advanced manufacturing environment, you name it. So this is what we call an integrated infra, uh, IT and operational technology network, but also with our modern technology, we also are gonna have private clouds and public clouds that we're using within our networks. And that's kind of a key observation here, is that um, nowadays we have virtualization technology, microservice architectures, containers, cloud computing. So we have, uh, on average, a large number of resources. And with IPv6 coming along, we have lots of IP space um, at our hands. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to talk about here with scale. We can deploy many honeypots using traditional, or not traditional, but new technologies, DevOps tool chains and such. So we can deploy many nodes and create um, a lot of confusion. Um, that technology is now available for us. But another aspect of confusion is what I call honeypot dynamics. And this was inspired by how container uh, micro -architect, microservice architectures are, are behaving. In particular with container technology, uh, and this is actually what spurred my thought process here, 
is that we have the capability to spin up, say, a container to service a given request and then spin it back down. So we have this idea of short-lived services. And so that's made me start thinking, is that what if we just put a twist on how honeypots work and not only do we have our traditional static honeypots, but what if we were to create dynamic honeypots? By dynamic, I'm talking about port-based dynamics and IP-based dynamics. So not only can you, not only can we deploy lots of nodes, we can make, we can move them around, we can move them across IP addresses, we can move them across TCP ports. So if you have a web server or, or some type of a web, a web server based app, a honeypot application, you don't have to listen on port 80, you can listen on any kind of a port you want. And how this works in terms of creating time delays is that we start impacting the attacker's um, cycle. In particular, their map and attack portion of the cycle. So when they're mapping their networks, they see one thing. When they come back at a certain amount of time later and try to attack, there's a totally different scenario. And so <laughs> if you can imagine the frustration of, uh, the, uh, of the attacker doing, going through this cycle, and I've actually seen it, they just keep coming and keep coming because they can't figure out what's going on. And so a particular attack source stays there. I've watched um, on my own uh, uh, ex ex uh, uh, sorry, research environments, you know, stay for an hour trying to figure out what's going on. So it's, 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 it's kind of cool. And so, sorry, you probably can't see the code here very well. But um, a few things I wanted to point out here. This is just a basic, uh, server implementation written in Python using sockets. And what I'm doing here um, at the top, you'll see this response um, variable that is simply a, just a, a basic HTTP header. And the goal here is that um, any time a client connects to this server, uh, the server sends back the response header and kills the connection. So if it's someone that's, once again, just in this example, that's probing this um, server, it'll think that it's some type of a web server. In this example, I'm using uh, connection-oriented um, dynamics where anytime, it anytime the server receives a connection request, it just sends back that basic header and then kills it and then starts back up on a different port. Is this a different port? Yes. Um, but the rest of the examples I'm gonna have well, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, here's in the output of that process. Um, it starts up listening on port 81, it gets a connection request, sends back the header, comes up on a different port, and so on and so on. But that's a very basic process. So what if we wanted to do multiple servers uh, of any type, but in this case, once again, just as an example, it's HTTP based. But what if I wanted to run multiple servers on multiple ports. Well, we can add some threading, um, use some various libraries, and in this example, um, there's a, on the right side there, is a simple while loop where we're spinning up a bunch of servers, we're letting them run for a certain amount of time, in this case 15 seconds, and then we spin them down. And so these servers are just constantly going up on some random ports. But there's a problem with this approach. Uh, one is code complexity. I mean, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, also, if you noticed, and I pointed out, I'm just sending back a basic HTTP header. So in terms of honeypots, this would be called a lightweight interaction honeypot. Nothing really uh, interesting about it, and the attack source would, would not probe it very long before they move on. But there turns out to be an interesting Python-based framework out there called Twisted that can help us solve this, some of these problems. And so Twisted is an, it's an event-driven networking engine that's written in Python. It's based on what's called a reactive programming model and essentially lets you work with highly asynchronous applications. And as a lot of people say, they, Twisted comes with batteries and that's one interesting piece in terms of creating honeypots is that there's already a lot of built-in server applications available in there. There's web servers, mail servers, SSH servers, you name it. 
And the Twisted, it lets the programmer focus on the actual application protocol, and Twisted takes care of everything else for you. And in terms of developing an open source based honeypot um, project, uh, there's a lot of existing open source projects out there that are based on Twisted that fit very well. And projects that are enterprise class, IoT based, industrial internet of things based and such. And so in this example, I'm just illustrating a few little things about Twisted. First of all, um, this is a full-fledged web server. Uh, and it really only takes two line, three lines of code to bring up a full-fledged web server. Now in this case, uh, it assumes that there is a web directory called web in the current working directory that uh, contains all of your website files. But in terms of serving, there's really only three, there's really only two lines of code and one to kick off the reactor. One of the things I wanted to point out here in this example as well is um, how I had to figure out how to spin up servers and work with the underlying reactor. Um, and I found this uh, function called call later. It's basically a, a way to schedule tasks or whatever uh, inside of um, Twisted. And the reactor manages it, but um, what we can do, and it looks, I call it R run because of, it looks a little recursive. It's not recursive, but what I do is I make my first call to this function called R run. Um, I tell the reactor to remove everything that might exist. I create a random port, create um, the web server, which turns out to be a, a composition of a, a file object and a side object. That becomes what we call, or what normally would be called a factory. And then I once again call that call later function pointing to this same function. So it just kind of keeps calling itself. And so um, I'm also telling it to do it every 25 seconds in this example. But what this is meaning is that this server is going to come up, this full fledged web server is going to come up 25 se seconds later, it's going to die and it's going to come back up on a different port. Now, obviously, things like time. Uh, duration, that's just a parameter that you might want to tweak. I'm just using uh, these numbers for examples here. And if you look on the right side, you can actually see it in action and you can actually see it doing a full um, web-based you know, um, response with regular headers as well as the index file that it, that it uh, served in this example. And so because it's Python based, we can actually take it a step further. And so in this example, I was like, okay, well, we want to have multiple servers, right? So what I did is I just um, packed all of the basic functionality into this class I called Simple Web. And then this example right here just shows that, you know, we spin up four of them and tell it to run. And, and this is the output. Now this would be a static. This right here didn't have any of the dynamics involved. But um, what I wanted to point out is in less than, 19, less than 20 lines of code, we're spinning up four full-fledged web servers. It's pretty impressive. Now this is an example where I actually extended it and made it dynamic. So there's a little bit more code. I introduce, you know, I, I bring in my R run function again and have a simple uh, loop where I spin up a, a set of servers and then they run for a certain amount of time, in this case, 20 seconds, and then they come back down. So we can take this to the extreme. You can actually, you're only limited to your computing resources in, in the types of servers that you bring up, and they don't all have to be web. I'm just keeping it simple for this example. So your possibilities are limited here, plus they're full heavyweight servers. And this is just an example of of, um, of it running. Uh, if you look in towards the, the backside, you can see that a certain number of servers will come up. They'll listen for a, little, a, short, a certain amount of time and then they die. And on the right side, you can see that it does, you know, just like the last um, image, we're getting back the full, H, you know, complete set of HTTP headers as well as the web page. 
Now, I mentioned earlier that I had been tinkering with some of this inside of industrial internet technologies and that other projects are out there that are built on top of Twisted. And this is just one example of uh, a project called Modbus. Modbus is a certain type of industrial control system protocol. And there turns out to be a Python project out there that implements Modbus. So in this example here, I'm actually spinning up an industrial internet honeypot based off of our, that's, you know, for Modbus. And most of the code here is just code needed to start up the Modbus server. Uh, the twisted part for doing the dynamic is just that, that same R run function. So uh, what I've shown here is just some examples on how you can actually implement some very heavyweight honeypots with Twisted because of their built-in functionality with very little bit of code. You can do this fast. And as I mentioned, in terms of trying to crawl, you know, one of the goals is creating confusion. And to do that, we need to do it at scale. And I didn't get into the, you know, the, the other side of how do we implement it in scale, but you know, we have technologies like uh, Kubernetes and all these other cloud environments that let us orchestrate large numbers of devices. So when we can couple this together, we can actually really create a lot of confusion uh, and uh, increase the cost on attackers. So just in closing, as I mentioned, the goals of this project was to come up with a way to you know, uh, help us as defenders uh, shrink the amount of time we need to do our work, but increase the amount of time it takes for an attacker to get uh, to do um, what they're doing. Um, we're trying to protect from both insider threats and external threats. And as I mentioned, we do have the technology to do this. Uh, honeypots, I believe they're actually, there's a lot of new companies coming online that uh, provide honeypot technology. So it's a new kid on the block. And um, the, the, the code that I'm uh, illustrating here is on my GitHub account. Um, under a folder called DDT, I call it the Dynamic Deception Toolkit. And so feel free to look at that code, extend it, whatever. And that's it. Thank you.